Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. Now, as I told you, I got sober in 1979. We could read the big book unsupervised in those days. And also, we got sober on reading the whole book. We didn't get this 164 pages stuff. And I got sober in 1979. The third edition of the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous came out in 1978. And I didn't have anybody ever tell me that their second edition was better than my third edition. I didn't have anybody say to me, oh, I don't know where the stories are. I don't, you know, the people that taught me about Alcoholics Anonymous had read the new book, were familiar with all of it so that they could meet me where I was. They were ready to be of service to me. They weren't standing there waiting for me to figure out how I could be like them and get something that they had that I couldn't get. So, for those of you who don't know, this is the fourth edition of the book, Alcoholics Anonymous. If you haven't read it, do it, and when you work with somebody, work out of this book. Whoa, all my notes are in my third edition. Transfer it. I mean, come into this. This book is eight years old, nine years old. Why don't you try coming into the 21st century? This is a very good opinion. It should be yours. To wit, wit. (laughs) Um, whenever I have the the privilege of getting somebody, buying somebody a copy of the book Alcoholics Anonymous, I always go to page 180. Oh my God. And because in this is, it's in Dr. Bob's Nightmare. And whenever I have the privilege of, of, of talking to somebody, I say, read Dr. Bob's Nightmare, pay really close attention to the last few pages, because you'll know why it is that we're all excited to see you. And uh, in fact, when I, when I work with alcoholics now, we read Dr. Bob's Nightmare before we go into the prefaces. My wife, when she heard I was doing this, ran out with the first guy that I was doing it. We're sitting in the in the living room, she runs out and she says, you're killing people. (laughs) Anyway, so um, uh, in Dr. Bob's Nightmare, he says, after this litany of just awful, awful drinking and all this stuff, he said, uh, that was June 10th, 1935, and that was my last drink. As I write, nearly four years have passed. Down at the end of the, he talks about, you know, what it was that Bill carried to him. And he says, it is a most wonderful blessing to be relieved of the terrible curse with which I was afflicted. My health is good, and I have regained my self-respect and the respect of my colleagues. My home life is ideal, and my business is as good as can be expected in these uncertain times. I spend a great deal of time passing on what I've learned to others who want and need it badly. I do it for four reasons. Number one, a sense of duty. Number two, it is a pleasure. Number three, because in doing so, I am paying the debt my debt to the man who took time to pass it on to me. And four, because every time I do it, I take out a little more insurance for myself against a possible slip. Unlike most of our crowd, I did not get over my craving for liquor much during the first two and one half years of abstinence. It was almost always with me. But at no time have I been anywhere near yielding. Later on, he goes on to say that if you think you're an atheist, an agnostic, a skeptic, or have any other form of intellectual pride which keeps you from accepting what is in this book, I feel sorry for you. But if if you still think you are strong enough to beat the game alone, that is entirely your affair. 
But if you really and truly want to quit drinking liquor for good and all, and sincerely feel that you must have some help, we know that we have an answer for you. It never fails. If you go about it with one half the zeal you have been in the habit of showing when you were getting another drink, your Heavenly Father will never let you down. And that is my experience, is that uh, I'm an active AA guy. These are active AA guys. Drinking and using took up between 16 and 21 hours a day, depending on what kind of help I had to help me along, right? I mean, I was always going after it. And what is it that I have to pay for that? What is it that this terrible curse with which I was afflicted? My stepmother died from cirrhosis of the liver. My brother-in-law died from cirrhosis of the liver. I've got a sister with 22 years of sobriety. I've got another sister who doesn't have a problem with drugs and alcohol, but she dates poorly and marries worse. And if you saw her, you would say this poor homeless woman when you see her and her husband. But this is the life that they have chosen. They, they, they have no desire in, in, in doing stuff that folks do. And, uh, uh, and if you go out through my cousins, every single one of my cousins has been institutionalized or has way too many children by people that have interesting tattoos all over their body and, uh, and have done time. And, uh, and so alcoholism has devastated my family. And yet I walk a free man today. And what does it take me? What does it take me? It takes getting up in the morning and ask for a little help. I spend maybe 20 minutes in the morning uh, uh, doing one form of meditative practice or another, and then I do a little more writing and stuff. And so it takes me, say, a half hour in the morning. During the course of the day, I take phone calls. Who knows how many calls I take? It's not that many. It's not that many. And then in the evening, I tend to go to a meeting or I have a meditation group in my house or I have some other commitment that I'm, I'm out doing stuff with you guys, right? Um, and I have been lifted from this incredible curse. And so that's why I do it. And why I do it is that it only happens by working with others. The only way that I live free and clear is by giving it away in order to get it. And, you know, again, this idea that somehow I've got to know what I'm doing, I mean, it's ridiculous. Thank you. Um, <laughs> you know, this either, um, you know, somewhere in that book it says either God is everything or God is nothing. So either I'm going to let the higher power run the deal or I'm going to try and run it. Now, Bill has seen me run the deal. And uh, and when he came in, I was, uh, you know, I mean, I was as active and did as effective work as I've ever done in Alcoholics Anonymous when I was running the show, when I was sober man, armed with steps, concepts, and traditions. And I had them lined up. You know, they were coming into my house and doing all that stuff and had them out, you know, going after it. But ultimately, I couldn't carry that weight, and I had to lie the power of power to actually run the show. There was nothing I hated more when I was first sponsoring Bill than some dried-up old geek that said, Ah, if they're going to do it, they're going to do it. If they're going to get it, they're going to get it. I can't make them. I'd say, you're killing alcoholics. Give them to me. I'll show them how to do this program. Work the steps or die. Yeah, I know. <laughs> I was just wondering if there was any message I needed to hear. I think it was the work the steps or die that God was responding to. Uh, but uh, but anyway, so what what uh, what ended up um, happening is that uh, that when I let the higher power run the show, it all got easier. It all got easier. And nowadays what I say is, 
Oh, if they're going to get it, they're going to get it. <laughs> you know, and then I let guys that are, you know, and, and that's the thing is we're a spiritual continuum. So the people that have got to hear the message in a clear, undiluted, direct manner now, I give them to John Gunner. That's fine. You know, I mean, it's, it's, it's a real, you know, so I mean, because we're all in, 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 in different sp- stages at different times. And the only thing that's necessary is that I'd be helpful. Now, one of the other lies that you hear along the I don't have the time is, well, well, if I do everything that AA says, then, you know, what if somebody calls me and says, will you come on the marathon on Christmas? And I've got a family. I can't go to AA because of that. No, that's you have a commitment to your family. You can say, no, excuse me, I have a commitment. Spiritual truths will never violate. They never cross. You know, if it's, if you're, if you're doing, and, and it's like, you want to be a really good parent? Sponsor people. What? Well, when you, when I sponsor people, what happened is, is I learned that I can know exactly how another human being should go about functioning in their life. I know the steps they should take, how they should go about it, and if they'll just follow my direction, their life will be wonderful. And they don't do it. And their life ends up being wonderful. Right? And so what happens is, is I get all that ego knocked out of me so that when my daughter becomes a teenager, I can be willing to give her advice and then not throw her away because she doesn't take it. <laughs> because I've already seen that the big guy's got a plan. You know, that the, however her life's going to unfold, it's how her life's going to unfold. And I can sit there and say, you know, you ought to do this, but it's exactly the same thing as me trying to do that with a sponsee. So what happens is, is the sponsees were able to soften me enough so I could be a good father. Now, I know you can't believe this, but also with my wife, I sometimes know exactly how she should be. <laughs> this also is why God created an Al-Anon. We have a group conscience in my house, my wife and my cat and myself, that life really works a lot better when I go to my weekly Al-Anon meeting. Uh, speaking of an outside issue, but this really is an inside issue. <laughs> and the whole thing about being able to learn um, about the Al-Anon thing, I want to I want to mention that Bill's dad, uh, Gordon, taught us a really good thing, which is that when you reach the point, notice that I say when you reach the point that you're willing to go and learn from women and men who have real experience in dealing with insane people on a regular basis, Um, keep your mouth shut. Don't take up their airtime. Listen to what it is that they have to say. Learn from them. And when I I went to Al-Anon, there was a situation in my home with with my wife's health where I was like, managing and controlling her and doing the best I could. And, uh, you know, just if she'd only follow my direction. And at one point, after all I had done for her, she looked at me and said, you know, this is where I pack. And so I just shut my mouth and I went to an Al-Anon meeting. And, uh, and what happened is, is that by listening to the experience of the women and men there, I gradually, you know, I was so busy trying to control my wife's life that their consciousness raised me up so that I could get off her enough that the higher power could enter in and save her life. So, you know, this thing about me knowing what it is that's supposed to be going on is really delicate. So what I need to do is I need to keep being of service in Alcoholics Anonymous because you're the ones that teach me, keep me teachable. You're the ones that gets presented with me to teach me the lesson. See, it used to be, you know, and one of the great things about sponsorship is you get to go through the sober man phase where you know everything and you're t- speaking down to people. But then gradually what happens is, is that you just become a member of the group. You know, I'm just another drunk. Now, I know a lot better than most of the people in my meeting, but that's another thing entirely. But, you know, <laughs> but the thing is, is that how do I, how much do I insist that? Sponsorship is what keeps me better. If, uh, if you have a lot of employees, 
sponsor people. You know, you start to learn about what it is you can and cannot do. Uh, and uh, that's another one where the Al-Anon literature is very helpful, the Courage to Change book, before you go in and tell... The, uh, anyway, it just makes things a lot easier. Uh, and so this thing of always being in the book is a great blessing. There was a guy who just recently uh, uh, passed away, uh, Paul Martin. And um, if you haven't listened to, to Paul's talks, uh, you know, you can get them for fun and for free. You can download them off uh, xaspeakers.org. And Paul, uh, it was really fun. I, I, uh, I called him a couple years ago because I wanted to know about a, uh, a, a relationship that he had with, uh, with his sponsor. And so I, after getting through to him, and the guy at the time, when he died, he had, he was what? He had 62 years, years of sobriety, and he was like 89 years old or something. I mean, he was just... I call him, the guy spent a half an hour on the phone with me, but before we started to talk, he said, okay, how long are you sober? I said, well, you know, I'm sober 28 years. Good. Do you have a sponsor? Yes. When's the last time you talked to your sponsor? Well, I talk to him every week. I got a half hour slot that I talk to him. Said, okay, good. He said, when's the last inventory you did? I said, about six, seven months ago. He said, uh, are you in the book with other alcoholics? Oh, yeah. He said, okay, now we can talk. I know who I'm talking to. <laughs> because he was used to talking to a lot of people that hadn't treated alcoholism. <clears throat> and when we got done with the conversation, he said, kid, I want to tell you something. <clears throat> he said, if you're not in the book with other alcoholics, if you're not going to meetings, if you're not talking to somebody on a regular basis and sharing costly things, in other words, the things that you wish weren't true about yourself, he said, if you're not doing that stuff, you will go insane. And he said, I have watched it happen with hundreds and hundreds of people with long-term sobriety that I love. So in other words, what I do is I just keep keep with it, you know, and uh, and with my sponsor, uh, I call him every uh, Tuesday night at 9.30. Now, why do I do that? I do it because I ask this man to sponsor me because he's the man that I admire most in Alcoholics Anonymous. He's, uh, he's uh, 58 years old, and he's got 35 years of sobriety. I want what he has. And uh, and he's an active AA member, and I and I call him, and I want to spend time with him, and I want to get to learn how he lives his life. And of course, it's amazing the parallels that we that we share. And so, you know, I'm putting myself in that in that position because I want what he has. Now, I sponsor a lot of guys. Anybody wants, they got a, they got a half hour slot with me. But you'd be amazed how few actually have that. <clears throat> Um, the other reason that I sponsor uh, is that um, it keeps me aware of the mir miracle of my own recovery and the miracle of my day, the miracle of the marriage I have, the miracle of the relationship I have with my daughter, with my grandmother, and with my wife. One other thing is is that uh, that another reason why I sponsor is that I sponsor so I can be available. Now, Bill, when he got uh, he started on interferon. I knew that for me to, you know, my first reaction was, well, make sure you call me every day because you're going to be going through a difficult time. And then I realized it was insane. He didn't call me all the time anyway. But, but, but the thing was, is that if I wanted to be helpful to my sponsee, to my friend, I needed to call him. So this is not a one-way thing. And if I can give you the one thing that I, 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 I want you to, to remember, if you can't remember anything else, is, you know, if they're sick enough to ask you for help, you can't hurt them. But the second thing is that God never puts two people together to only help one. God never puts two people together to only have one. Thank you. Matt the alcoholic. 
there's a something we say in AA is pick up the phone, use the phone. And uh, I think the implication is don't be a secret, don't isolate, call and tell somebody what's going on with you. But I got this lesson in that, um, and underneath the chapter heading of today's section, this section of uh, why do we do it, um, I think one of the reasons we don't pick up the phone is maybe we think we're different. Maybe we think somebody won't understand our particular situation. Or, or I was talking to a guy earlier today who said, I didn't think anybody drank like me. And then I forgot there was a guy who I drank with who was in AA. And that blew that. So we don't pick up the phone. And we, the implication, again, is we're isolating. We should call someone and tell them our problems. Well, I've heard a lot of stories in AA when people get here. Uh, I know my story. I thought I had problems that were insurmountable. I had a brand new baby. I had all sorts of debt. Uh, my mother was sick with cancer. I couldn't get a job. It seemed to me like my problems were insurmountable. But then I heard this story about this other guy and the way he used the phone, and it totally humbled me and it changed the way I looked at this whole thing. Now, this guy had been really, really wealthy. He had a lot of money. And... The economy went bad, and he lost the money. And he didn't have much, and he'd been, through his drinking, he lost the money. And he had tried to get sober, and he drank again. He tried to get sober, and he drank again. And he was reduced to, to living off his wife's minimum wage job. And he was humiliated, and he got sober. He stopped drinking for a few months. And he had had a long, hard fall. And he was a bad alcoholic, and all he had was a few months of sobriety. And he found a position that he could get into where maybe he could make some money and get back on top. And he had to go out of town. He went on a business trip. And he was humiliated in the process because it didn't go his way. And this was his big promise. This was how he was going to fix it all for his family and get back on top. And he was desperate, and he was alone. And he just had a couple of months of sobriety, and he decided to use the phone. But he was in a bad situation. He didn't have a bunch of people to call in AA. He was in a lonely city, and he picked up the phone, and he had a list of people, and he called 10 different people to find somebody to help. He didn't even look for someone to tell his problems to. Now, back home, he had a priest who had helped him. He had a doctor who had helped him, and he had his wife. But he called 10 strangers, basically out of the phone book. They were actually on a on a church directory, and he got the number of somebody who knew somebody who had alcoholism that he could help. And that was Bill Wilson. And he didn't pick up the phone to dump. That's not why we're supposed to pick up the phone. <laughs> we're supposed to pick up the phone to get out of ourselves and help. And I was in AA and read that book, and that didn't occur to me for seven or eight years. And when I finally, I was actually at a play. Bill drags us off to this play from time to time. And they showed Bill the scene where Bill's calling the people. And you start to realize this guy called people. There's no AA, right? Nobody knows. When you call, okay, hey, I'm looking for an alcoholic I need to talk to. They think you're crazy, right? And he did that 10 times, got hung up on, got some direction. People thought, what are you talking about? You imagine that. Imagine that. And we have all of this. We have all of these meetings. And it was so humbling for me because sometimes I can't pick up the phone to talk to the guy that left me a message that said, can you call me back? And I do. I, pick, I do do that. But it's, it, I don't want to sometimes. And I think that's another point I'd like to talk about. But the whole thrust of what we believe is that it is in helping other people that you get the spiritual life. It's not in the 11th, 11 steps. It's in the 12th step. And when I read that and saw that play, and what they did, the technique in this play is he would call somebody and say, you have an alcoholic to help, and then the light would go off. And then the light would come back on him again, and he was dialing another number, and then the light would go off. And then he did that ten times, and then he had to wait a whole night and not drink in a strange town with a failed business proposition and go find someone to help. He did not go to Dr. Bob's house and go, I got problems, man. Let me tell you about my problems. <laughs> he said, I used to be able not to stop drinking, and I haven't had a drink in a few months. Can I talk to you? And he changed the course of the world. Yeah. 
I mean, that's not a, an exaggeration. And I'm Irish. I'm prone to exaggeration. So the other thing that, from my own personal experience, and I always feel more comfortable speaking from my personal experience, is, you know, I have been given a wonderful life. I've been given a, a wonderful life. I was destitute and morally bankrupt and spiritually bankrupt and financially underwater, and I've been given this wonderful life. And we read the big book a lot uh, in my, when I do my sponsorship, and, you know, at least the guy gets to the part in the big book where it talks about Jim. Remember the car dealer, Jim? And Jim, what does he do, right? He, he has an argument with his boss, and he goes out to the country. I love that. He leaves the city to go to the country to sell a car. I understand, Jim. I'm going to go where there are fewer people. And then I'll find someone to buy this car. But when I read that part, there's a line in there that, that makes a chill run up my spine. It says, all went well for a while for Jim, but he failed to enlarge his spiritual life. So when I read that, I, I get a little bit nervous because you could write Matthew. You could just take Jim out, put Matthew in there. All has gone well for a while for Matthew. I, I met and married the woman of my dreams an Alcoholics Anonymous. She's not an AA. I met her at a bus stop, fell madly in love. We've been married for years. I've never lied to my wife. I kissed the ground in the morning that she's married to me. We have a happy, fulfilling relationship. I don't know where this came from. I have two little children, three children, but two littler children that feel safe with me. I have this life that's all has gone well for a while for me. It hasn't all been great. Bad things have happened. Good things have happened. But when I read that, I think, wow. And as you stay sober longer, or as I stay sober longer, I'm kind of like, well, how do I enlarge my spiritual life? When you're new, your spiritual life is so small, it's pretty easy to enlarge. <laughs> Not much to do. I'll go to the meeting. Hey, I actually grew by a, a nano piece exponentially. Yeah, it's twice as large, but it's still this small. But I've been sober a long time. I've been on long meditation retreats. I've led retreats. I meditate with these guys. I pray. I do the work with other alcoholics, but that's the crux of it, is how do you enlarge your spiritual life? And I find, for me, it's when I push myself outside my comfort zone. It's when I make myself take one step past what I'm comfortable doing. And I want to give an example of this. Is There was a guy I was sponsoring, and he ended up in the hospital, and he was going to die. He drank again. He held up in a hotel room, and his liver just went to hell. He turned completely yellow. Um, his eyes were bright red. He looked like the devil. He had all his blood vessels broke in his eyes. And he was admitted to a hospital. He didn't have anybody left in his family because they all had drank themselves to death. And I sponsored him for a very short time, and he was in a hospital not far from my house, and he was never going to come out. He was in ICU. They found him. When they found him, every wastebasket in his house was full of the blood he'd thrown up into it. So it was over for this guy. So I, he didn't know. He was in an alcoholic coma. And he didn't know, but I had told him the last time I went to see him in a coma that I would come back the next day. I just said to his body. And I went off to work. And I had a bad day. I work with doctors. I'm a, I'm a drug dealer. I sell drugs. <laughs> and uh, I, it was a rainy day, and we don't have a lot of those in Southern California, so nobody remembers how to drive. And they think, oh, it's raining. I must tailgate you. And it's kind of like that. And everybody was kind of off that day. I had a really frustrating time with these people. I was far away from my house. I was in the farthest reaches of my territory. I was discontented. I knew I was upset because... On the radio came Derek and the Dominoes, Layla, a classic great song. And I listened to the song for a minute and said, man, this song sucks. And I shut it off. And I went, wow, something's wrong, man. <laughs> you hate this song now? And I'm driving home on the freeway, and I remembered I was going to go see Mike. And I thought, oh, crap. I don't want to go see Mike. That's the last thing. I want to go see my wife. I want to hold my wife. I want to play with my kids. I want to forget about this day. But the men in Alcoholics Anonymous, these men particularly, but other men that I know, showed me AA. They didn't tell me AA. They drug me to hospitals. I remember going on a panel once, and I had like a year sober and not a pot to piss in. And I'm on a panel, and a guy walks in, and, he, and I knew the guy, and he was sober a long time, and he had a nice-looking wife, and he had a lot of money. And I'm like, what are you doing here? And he said, well, I'm doing the panel. I'm like, well... I have no life. I know why I come to the panel. <laughs> and this, it, these guys showed me, you go do this stuff. This is for real. We take this seriously. So I'm driving home thinking I'm not going to go see Mike. And literally the hospital's 
two blocks from my house. It's right around the corner from my house. And I don't want to go see him. I really don't. Because I got nothing for him. You know, I'm, I'm feeling pretty upset inside. I'm feeling kind of empty. And I'm driving by the hospital and my car pulled in. You know, it just pulled in. And it's raining and I've got a suit on. And I, so I got to get out and put my raincoat on and my hat. And I'm looking at the rain. I'm looking at the emergency room and I don't want to go in. So I get up, get out of the car, and it with just really uh, just walked in there feeling totally out of it, not connected. I got nothing for Mike. I don't really give a damn about him, to be honest, at that moment. I'm just being honest. I'd like to tell you I'm always full of enthusiasm. I'm not. And I walked into the emergency room, and there's the woman again in ICU, and she's saying, I'm sorry, family only. And I said, well, this guy's in an alcoholic coma. I've been coming every day. I'm his sponsor in AA. He doesn't have any family. Do you think maybe I could see him? And she looks as upset as I am at her day and as down as I am. And she's, you know, emergency room nurses. That's not a fun life. And she's flipping through his file. And my, my business card is stapled to every page of his file. And I'm like, that's me. That's me. <laughs> that's me. And I don't, I don't even want to have this argument. I want her to give me permission to get in my car and go home. But she does, and she said, well, I guess, but he's just in there, and he's not doing anything, and he's strapped down, and he's in a coma. And I walk in there, and they left the lights off. I sit at the end of his bed, and he has no teeth, and I forgot. I, I was looking at him, his mouth's open, and he's bright yellow. I mean, yellow like that shirt. He was yellow. And I looked at him, and he looked like he was dead. And his mouth was open, and his teeth were all messed up, and most of them were gone. And I remembered that he had told me he didn't like to go to the dentist, and so I'm looking at him, and I sat there for about 15 minutes, and it was dark and gloomy in there, and it wasn't comfortable, but I just thought, well, I said I'd come. I'm here. So I sat there, and when I felt like I had paid my dues, I got up, and I walked over to the side of his bed. I was just going to say goodbye to him, and he grabbed my hand, and he sat straight up, and he scared the shit out of me. <laughs> he went, boom, and I, ah! And he looked up at me. And he said, am I crazy? And I looked right at him. And I don't know why I said this. I think it, I think something else in me said this. I said, no, man, you're not crazy. You're an alcoholic. And he looked around the room and he didn't know where he was. And he looked back at me and he said, why do you love me so much? And I felt guilty. And I looked at him and I said, because you're just like me. You're me. And the whole world changed. Everything was perfect. All the planets aligned. The room changed. In me, everything changed. And he felt it too. I could tell he felt it too. And I hadn't failed to enlarge my spiritual life. And it didn't matter that I wanted to. You don't have to want to. And I didn't go to see Mike in the hospital to dump about my shitty day. I just went there to try to help by being present. And I was driving in today with Billy, and Mike called. Mike got out of the hospital. Mike's sober. Mike has a job. Mike's an active member of our home group. That's what happens here. And my message to you is it's okay if you don't always want to do it. I've learned that because I don't always want to do it. But if you go do it, some really wild shit can happen. <laughs> Guess what Mike's nickname is? <laughs> Jesus. <laughs> we'll report that to him. Well, yeah. Liver Mike. He's the one with the worst liver in the room. Uh, maybe, maybe. There's a good contest there, though. Um, that's a great story. Um, you ever had anybody say to you, he's not emotionally available for me? You ever heard that? They say that to us in many different ways. They say, you don't hear me when I talk to you. You don't listen. You're not there for me. 
you don't understand, they say it. And we look at them and we go, what the hell are you talking about? What is it you want from me? They think we're hiding something. They don't know that we don't have what they're looking for. You know? And what they mean when they say that to us, that you're not emotionally available for me, is that I've got something that they want, and I'm withholding it. And the truth is worse. I don't have it. And I don't know that I don't have it. You've convinced me that I've got it, and I'm helping you look for it. <laughs> and this is going to go on forever. Forever. And uh, now that I'm a newcomer in AA, if you would like me to be there for you, because things are starting to look better now. I'm not drinking, and I'm showing up for work, and I'm I'm present for experiences that are happening now. I'm, the conversations are different. Things are looking up. If you'd like me to really be there for me, for you, if you'd like me to be intimate with you, and, and what I mean by that term is where I can actually feel what you feel. I'm not just reacting to how you feel impacts me. I'm not just responding to your emotions. I actually have emotions of my own that I can connect with yours and we can interact on this emotional level and sometimes nonverbal where I, I get where you are. I feel you in the room. And if you're disturbed, I don't have to try to fix you. I can just kind of be there for you. If, if that's what you're really looking for from me, it's going to take about 10 years. I mean, it's not going to happen all of a sudden. You extract alcohol from my environment, and what you have is somebody that is very tense. You know, this is all very new. I don't know how to go to work without medication. I don't know how to interact with you. I can't comprehend having sex in sobriety. I mean, how do you actually look at him and make the deal and stuff? You know, I mean... What do you do with that? I mean, to, it was really incomprehensible. I don't think I'd ever had sex sober. So it was real hard for me to imagine doing it. It's very uncomfortable. And you can't admit that, too, you know, because it's very emasculine. So you have to kind of keep that to yourself and pretend, pretend like you're getting laid a lot, you know, <laughs> you know, to maintain the image. You know, you don't want people to know that you're just a frightened little boy inside. You don't even know that you're a frightened little boy. You cover it up with other stuff. The way men cover that up is with anger and arrogance and pomposity and stuff like that. You know, at least that's what I do with it, you know. And uh, <clears throat> if all I do in that 10-year period is go to 875,000 meetings, nothing will change. It won't even get a little bit better. <clears throat> I mean, I might get promoted at work, you know, something. But the chances are I might even start getting fired a lot. I might start losing jobs and stuff. You know, every time they want to give me more work, I might look at, at that like they're trying to take advantage of me. You know, you ever heard that? Sometimes you'll talk to guys and they'll say, well, yeah, they want to give me a promotion, but I'm not buying into that. They're going to give me a little bit of more money and a whole lot more responsibility, and not, they're not pulling that on me. And I'm looking at the guy like, they want to promote you, dude. <laughs> this is a positive event in your life, you know. Oh, bullshit. They're just trying to take advantage of me, you know. <laughs> It, it, this weird reaction to things, you know, very strange, very immature kind of reaction to stuff, you know. Uh, the thief s thinks everyone else is a thief. He figures he'll steal from you, you'll probably steal from him. That's our perception of the world, you know. The alcoholic is kind of paranoid and suspicious because he's a creep, you know, and he thinks everybody else is creepy too, you know. So that's our reality. You know, we haven't had the psychic change yet. We're just sober. That's all. Now, if I work the steps, if I work the steps, if I work steps like one through nine, and I do an inventory and I make some amends, things will get a little bit better, but that isn't going to do it. That's not it. The first step says that I'm powerless. Now, they took it easy on us. They said we're powerless over alcohol. 
because they didn't want to tell us the whole story for fear that we would run screaming down the street. My experience with powerlessness is, which I think takes about 20 years to really grasp the depth of it. He's kibitzing back here. <clears throat> I think I'm utterly powerless. I don't think I have any power over anything at all. And I'm one of these guys in AA that believes that when I got here, I was powerless, and by working the steps, I am then not re-empowered, so now that I have power. I think what the truth is, is that in nature, I have no power. In nature does not require me to have any power at all. It, everything just kind of unfolds all by itself. It doesn't require any input from me at all. It just kind of unfolds. And my job in this process is to be an audience, to watch the unfolding, to be part of it in the sense that I'm an observer of it. It doesn't unfold because of me. I am not the catalyst. It doesn't require that from me. If it's true that I'm utterly powerless, then I can't possibly manage anything because managers have power. So yes, my life is unmanageable by me, but the truth about that is it doesn't require me to manage it. I don't need to manage anything. And my suffering lies in the fact that I think I have power or should have power, and I insert myself into this process and I become extremely frustrated and I suffer from this because I keep trying to make things different than they are. I look at things and I label them right and wrong. I go, well, that shouldn't have happened. That's not fair. There's no justice in that. That's incorrect. So now I've had the negative event, and on top of that, I've determined it shouldn't have happened, and now I suffer on top of the hurt from the negative event. And I create all the suffering in my life. It does not come from nature. It comes from me in my judgment of it. I interpret my own experiences as if they need to be interpreted. I mean, I'll have an experience, and my initial reaction to the experience is, well, that was really interesting, and then a day or so later, I will have determined that it could have been a lot better than it was. So I even take from myself positive events that occurred in the past, and I reconstruct them and determine, well, that was stupid. You know? Therein lies my suffering. So if I can grasp this idea of, of powerlessness and unmanageability, the second step then becomes truly operational. I need a manager, and I need to be restored to sanity, certainly enough sanity not to drink and use, but also enough sanity to really understand the depth and truth of the powerlessness and unmanageability, to really see it, to come to understand the truth of it so that I can go to this power and say, geez, you're running it, man. I'm sorry about all that stuff in the past. I'm on board, dude. You know, I get it. I get it. You're running it. I'm cool with that. You know, if I can get that, then the third step becomes operational. What do you do with that? You turn your life and will over to it. What life and will? The fourth step, the resentments, fears, and the broken relationships. Resentment, certainly, because I try, my happiness is dependent upon your behavior. If you behave correctly, then I'm happy. So I have expended an immense amount of energy trying to get you to behave correctly, and you don't, and I get pissed off at my core about that. I'm not just a little bit upset. It changes my entire life. The, the level of anger and revulsion I have towards you is really hard to describe. It comes out in rage and in fits and seizures of anger, in my case. I mean, I just flip out over this kind of stuff. It changes my entire life. Fear because I know it's not working and I don't have an alternative. So I hate you and I'm afraid of you at the same time because I need you. I can't get along without you. And you're missing in my life. That's the hole that's in me is you. I'm alone in this world. Broken relationships, of course I have broken relationships. If what I'm bringing to the table is resentment and fear, how could I have anything other but than that? The fifth step is the ceremony that you and I go through to complete the third step. We tell ourselves maybe for the first time in our lives, another human being maybe the first time in our lives, and this power 
here's my stuff. You take it. I'm pooped. You know, I'm done. I can't do this anymore. Six and seven are about the character defects uh, Matthew touched upon. Becoming willing and humbly asking. We can see what the character defects are. They're in the fourth column of the resentment list. My faults and mistakes. It does not say my part. It says, what are my faults and mistakes? I'm unforgiving. I'm judgmental. I'm self-righteous. I'm arrogant. I'm pompous. Maybe I'm violent. I'm all this stuff. Whatever your cute little mix is, you can see what it is. You can see it. You can see the patterns in that fourth column. As the years go by, it becomes more and more clear because your focus on doing the inventory is towards that fourth column. You're not trying to avoid it anymore. You're going right there because you know that's where the problem is. It's never them. It's never you, ever, ever. It's always me. And I look for that now. So then the manager gives us our first assignment. He says, make amends. Take all the resentments and put them on your amends list. I'm going to help you rid yourself of these resentments. This is the mechanism we're going to use. So I go about that process. Now, at the end of that ninth step, am I emotionally available for you? No. There might be some hope, but I'm not there yet. This one through nine is about 15% of the program. And God, we have workbooks and pamphlets and seminars and we go on, we have 15 column expanded inventories. And, you know, if you're not doing it all the time, you're just not doing it. And I'm telling you, here's the Bill C program of that. If you're two or three or four years sober and you're working on your fifth or sixth inventory, throw it away. You miss the point. You know, it's not about inventory after inventory after inventory after inventory. That's just another form of self-obsession. This is not a self-help program. This is not an analytical program. This is a spiritual program. We're not looking for your character defects. We don't care. You know? I don't want to hear another goddamn inventory from you. <laughs> you know? You know? I'm tired of it. I'll tell you something. At 62 years old and 24 years sober, I am just bored to tears with myself. I mean, there's just no stone left unturned. I'm just not that interesting. I'm, you know, it's hard for me to admit that, but the truth is I'm just not that interesting. I mean, there just isn't much there. We're constantly looking for stuff that we've buried. The depth of our shallowness knows no bounds. There's nothing there. Most of our problem, most of your and my problem is what is missing, not what's there that doesn't work well. There's a whole bunch of stuff missing. I missed it all growing up. I need experiences now that will create some emotional depth, not find the old crap that's there and thrush it around, you know? You, on the other hand, are a never-ending font of weirdness. You know, I mean, you've brought some things to my attention I would have never considered, you know? So at the ninth step, 15% of the program. People talk about 10, 11, and 12 are the maintenance steps. Maintain what? What have we got to maintain? Is this thing just about not drinking? I don't think so. The not drinking has already happened. This is about living. Living at some comfort level where drinking may not be an option anymore. That would be nice. That's a nice side effect. To me, the focus is not about not drinking. I can't get you to not drink. I can't even maintain your sobriety for you. I'm powerless. I'm powerless. But I can help you and myself improve our spiritual condition. 10, 11, and 12 are 85% of the program. It's the way we live here. 10 is about living an examined life. It's about paying attention. It's the continuing inventory process. It's described in our book in conjunction with and part of the 11th step. I think they're just, they're inseparable. I mean, part of the 11th step process is about reviewing the day, being present, you know, that, that consciousness, being aware, living the examined life. There's a difference between self-obsession and self-awareness. There's a big difference between those two. And if what happened to me in March of 85 is I was awakened, the rest of the journey is to take that awakening and turn it into some kind of an awareness where I'm actually aware that I'm awake and that maybe there's something I can do with this. 
So I continue the inventory process. You want to stay in the inventory process? Sponsor people. You're always in the inventory process. It never stops. It never stops. There's a constant reviewing and being aware of and being conscious and being present in that present moment about what's actually happening right now all the time, in real time. The 11th step, one of the great beauties of the 11th step, and it's taken me a long time to really come to this. I understood this on an intellectual level for a long time, and it became real to me some years ago when I was going through the interferon process. And I was depressed, and I had anxiety, and I was just a mess. I was a mess. And my friend Christoph came to me, and he gave me a book, and he said, read this. And I go, yeah, I'll read it. And he yelled at me. He goes, read it, God damn it. He's French. you know. He's like, and, I, and so I actually read the thing. And in this book, The Power of Now, Eckhart Tolle tells this story. And I think this is the AA story. This is us. He tells the story at the very beginning of this book of waking up in the middle of the night with an anxiety attack one more time, one of many that had been going on for years. And he gets up out of bed in the middle of the night and he walks out in the living room and he says to himself out loud, I can't live with myself any longer. And then the very next thought is, well, then there must be two of me. If I can't live with myself, there must be two of me. Then the very next thought was, I wonder which one is real. I wonder which one is real. And I read that, and it hit me like a ton of bricks. And a lot of things fell into place. In the big book, Wilson says, selfishness and self-centeredness are the root of our problems. I don't think he was kidding. He says our constant, our very lives depend upon our constant thought of others and how we may help meet their needs. I don't think they were kidding. And he didn't say our lives would be better if. He tells us that our lives depend upon this kind of psychic change to where I'm actually thinking more of you than I do myself. And what is Tolley saying? What does Ramana Maharshi say? What does Keating say? What are all these guys? What are they all saying to us? It's about the disidentification with self, about the reduction of the sense of self. We here say the smashing of the ego. We use terms like, we actually, I think we got it right by mistake. We talk about our heads in the third person. We say, my head is out to get me. I think there's some truth to that, you know. I think, though, like Jay's wife Adele says, I think it's really trying to help me. It just doesn't know that it's negative, you know. <laughs> it's trying to help. It's trying to do what it can. It's really not an adversarial relationship. In the 11th step, in meditation, we can have the very real life experience of watching our thoughts. We can actually come to understand at depth and have the experience that we are not our thinking mind. That is a game changer. That changes the entire game. That changes everything. Because I believe I am my thinking mind. And if you hadn't brought that to my attention, I would have never questioned that. That question would never come up. I think, therefore I am. I just think stuff, and, and I go do it. <clears throat> and it creates a rag reality for me that I buy into. They're all out to get you. Well, of course they are. You know? but she didn't really mean that when she said that. I know, I know she didn't really mean it. <laughs> You're really not that good looking. Yeah, I know, I know. <clears throat> You're a fool, Bill. You're never going to figure it out. Yeah, shh, quiet. You know, don't say it too loud. Other people might hear. You know, and I. And this dialogue goes on. I believe it all, and it reduces me. It shrinks me. It never builds me up. It, for some reason, it never comes up with stuff. You know, Bill. All the men want to be you, and all the women want you. <laughs> it never comes up with that. I've never heard that. You know. My wife tells me that, though, isn't that cool? <laughs> you know what you do with a woman like that? You keep her. <laughs> she also tells me, she says, honey, you're not fat, you're luscious. <laughs> I love that. That's cute. <laughs> so 
so in the 12th step, the reason we do this is because there is nothing else for us to do. There is only one job in Alcoholics Anonymous, and it's that one. There are many, there are not many different forms of 12 step work. There's only one. We all know what it is. And we all come up with reasons why we don't have to do it. Or we'll put limitations on how we only have to do so much of it. And we've talked about some of that. Well, I'm too busy or there's other things. There's this illusion for some reason that we either do it all the time or never. You know, there's, once again, there's no middle ground. It's either this way or it's that way. But the truth about this work is, if I don't work with you, I will never confront my defects of character. The mechanism that the manager uses to bring this to the forefront, to cause us to see ourselves, is he sends me you. When I get on my knees and I ask for help, I shouldn't send it away when it shows up, and it's going to look a lot like you. He's going to send me you. I cannot recover without you. You are an integral part of the process. It's like Jay was say, saying, you, two people come together, not just one is helped. This is for both of us. This happens for both of us. And I never know how it's going to come at me. The last thing I want to do is try to control the experience. Now, there's two things that I do to try to force myself into a corner. It's my way, my own halting way of having some kind of discipline in my life. I have two rules that I live by, and I try very diligently to live by this. One, I always answer the phone. I don't look at the caller ID. I just answer the phone, and I try to have faith that whoever is coming into my life is supposed to be there. They're being sent. This is part of the plan. I don't have the power. The last thing I want to do is start screening the experience. Pretty soon, my belief is that the rerun of Law & Order that I'm watching is more important than you. That's the value judgment I will make. And the truth is, is that you are always more important, no matter who it is that's on the phone. And I need to let this happen, that there are no mistakes, that I'm not running it, I'm powerless, whatever's coming is supposed to be there. Rule number two, never say no. Sometimes you end up in New Orleans eating duck gumbo. <laughs> Other times you're in Rialto, with a bunch of toothless cowboys, you know. <laughs> you got to take the good with the bad, you know. You know, it just, you know, it is what it is. It's a crapshoot, you know. If you never say no, you will end up in strange places, in compromised situations, in situations where you don't know the rules, and you don't get it, and you don't know how to behave, and you don't know who the people are, and you feel separate from them. That's how you grow. Other times you end up in very loving environments, having an experience you never thought would occur with people that you never thought you could ever get along with because somehow you're different and you come to realize you're not. You're just not. How else do you find that out? You have, in, over the years, and I, I learned this from Jay. I mean, the way I was raised in AA... We went on 12-step calls together. We went to the hospitals, and we always answered the phone. And he told me things like, you can't be a member of Alcoholics Anonymous if you're not on the 12-step list down at the central office. I ran right down there and signed up. I figured that's where you get the ID cards, you know. I mean, Jesus. I finally found my people. I didn't want to, you know, I want to be a card-carrying member, you know. And a lot of this was jokes to him. I took it all serious and just walked around. And you know, I drove the assault vehicle. He started looking at me and go, go get your car. He wouldn't even ask me. He says, just go get the car. And I would go get the car. You know, we'd go somewhere. You know, I thought everybody was doing this. I didn't know that it wasn't like this. You know, I thought everybody did it. When I started sponsoring guys and you weren't doing it, it confused me. <laughs> How come you don't want to go? How come? Why aren't you going? Well, I got to do something. Like what else? <laughs> What's more fun than this? And they'd say, well, my kids. I go, the hell with your goddamn kids. You know, you don't even like them anyway. Let's go. Bring the kids. You know? 
you know, I, I do these workshops, I started doing these things, and this woman said to me, she says, well, you know, I can't sponsor all these people. I've got two young kids, and like you, I was raised in AA, and my parents abandoned me for AA, and I'm not going to let that happen to my children. I'm not going to do it. And I go, so you don't sponsor anybody? She goes, no, I don't have time. And I said, what do you mean you don't have time? She said, I have to be with my kids. And I said, well, geez, why do you have to leave your kids to sponsor people? And she was like speechless. Well, of course you do. I said, no, bring them home. Help them, have them fold your diapers for you, you know? <laughs> I can't count the number of times I stood on the side of soccer fields and talked to some guy during the practice because that's where you had to come and get me because I was coaching soccer, you know. I mean, guys went to soccer tournaments with me and stuff, and they'd show up at my house, and my daughter would go, who's he? <laughs> I came home one day, and my little daughter is 10 years old. She's on the phone. I'm walking through the living room, and I hear her say to this guy on the phone, well, have you done your inventory? <laughs> And I stopped and looked at her, and I said, who's that? And she says, Owen. And I said, good, keep it up. <laughs> you know? What better example to give your children? Can you imagine a better example? I mean, I'm a goddamn saint, you know. I mean, they say grew up believing, you know, all these weird. I used to take them down to Skid Row, and we'd hand out food to people and stuff with a bunch of AA people. And What a better example to show your children then you're being selfless and you're out trying to help people and out trying to do something, trying to do some good, trying to make a difference. My daughter graduated from college and guys showed up to see this little girl they watched grow up because they grew up They grew up in my garage with me reading the book while they were kicking the ball up against the garage door, you know. We'd close the door to get some privacy. They'd come out and kick the ball. Let's go kick the ball against the door, you know. <laughs> bam! I mean, rarely have we seen, bam, a person fail who's, you know... <laughs> I mean, and this is true stuff. So the reason we do it, the reason we do this work, is that's how we heal. It is the 85, maybe 90% of the program. All the other stuff is in theory. It's sober 101 that we do. The practical application of all this comes when we start carrying the message. Thank you. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.